myself, we can get the meeting started. All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, if you are on today's agenda, if you would just unmute yourself um, when, it, when I call on you. And then just let everyone know that we are gonna record this meeting and it'll be available on our YouTube channel. Um, for those maybe who couldn't join us today, we'll watch in the future. So with that, I am going to call this 33rd meeting of the year to order. We, this is um, our last virtual meeting, and I am so happy to say that. Um, we are gonna return to the before times um, when we can gather together again at Maggiano's. So we will be at Maggiano's on April 9th. We're not meeting next Friday for the holiday weekend, um, but please, I encourage everyone to go to the website and we have to sign up. I have to register in advance. The meals, there'll be plated lunches served and they need to know the head count. So um, do we have, in, in a, not, not our guest speaker, do we have any other guests um, in, to introduce themselves? I don't think I saw any faces I didn't recognize. Um, if you have any, anyone have any joys and concerns they'd like to share before we um, go to the invocation? I've got a joy. And, and, uh, and I'll, I'll mention the invocation too. I'm actually sitting in Stephanie Free's office at Dickinson Place. Uh, the, the big vaccine shoot up is happening right now with, uh, with uh, seniors who are very low income seniors who kind of fell between the cracks. They can't get out to the state fairgrounds. They can't do this. And yet they didn't get the privileges that people at retirement communities got since they were locked in. So shooting up hundreds of people today. That's wonderful, Richard. Great. Stephanie well, will be speaking a, to the program on the night. So Stephanie will be speaking to us. She is, yes. That's great. It's great of you to be there to help. Um, well, let's take a quick look at our birthday slide. Let's see who, who we're celebrating, who's got birthdays coming up. Um, we've had a lot of birthdays this month uh, that we're celebrating. And Right now, well, today actually is Donnie Berg's birthday. He is a past president of the club. Kyle, happy birthday to you. I know you're on the call. And Sam Miller as well, also on the call. Um, but I, everyone that did celebrate their birthday in March, we wanna wish you a happy birthday and use that as your reminder to make donations to both our RCPC Foundation and um, the RI Foundation. This is, this is your month, okay. With that, I'm going to um, introduce the next three speakers. We're gonna have Richard, uh, thank you again for doing the invocation. Um, following that will be our Pledge of Allegiance and our national anthem. Mark Kasher is here to spotlight our marketplace advertiser. And Holly is gonna tell us about what's going on with the Legacy of Leadership Project. Okay, we'll start now with Richard. Um, Would you bow your heads? Father, we particularly remember today uh, Barb and, and Kevin. Um, they lost a friend, uh, uh, Steve Henry, in a tragic automobile accident, not of his causing. It's just an awful thing. We pray for them, comfort them, and comfort his widow, their longtime friend, Becky Henry. Uh, it's such a tragedy, and... and uh, but we know you're there to help and comfort in ways that we don't always see. Um, thank you for what's going on today at Dickinson Place. Thank you for the vaccines. Uh, it's been sort of a vaccine miracle. Uh, it's been so bad losing uh, over 500,000 Americans. It could have been so much worse, but somehow a vaccine was found in record time, vaccines in record time. And, and we credit you with that, uh, with giving uh, human beings the power to, to come up and do things that ha have never been done before. And um, we do ask your calming hand on our society these days. Uh, we live in the new internet age and there's all kinds of information and we disagree on the facts and, 
and we're having a hard time adjusting to the, the free flow of information uh, and misinformation. Uh, help our society. We seek comfort. We give thanks. We seek your calming hands. Uh, we pray all of this in the name of, uh, in, in your name, God, and we thank you for it all. Amen. And now for our Pledge of Allegiance. Join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. For all. Next up, we have Mark Kasher. He's going to do our marketplace advertiser. Thank you, President Barb. Uh, this is a spot where we get to to highlight one of our members' businesses who uh, advertises in our newsletter. So today's advertiser that we are going to spotlight is Philip Ray. Philip Ray practices criminal and juvenile defense law with an office in Dallas on Maple Avenue and an office in Frisco. He received his undergrad degree at Austin College and law degree at Texas Tech. He's an attorney, uh, he, he board certified in criminal law with extensive trial experience in helping families through difficult times. Mr. Ray assists those people who are accused of, witnesses to, or victims of offenses in Dallas, Collin, and Denton counties. He regularly defends citizens accused of major felony crimes, including murder and manslaughter, aggravated robbery, aggravated sexual abuse of a child, home burglary, possession of a controlled substance, aggravated assault, uh, intoxicated manslaughter, and other accusations as well. As a former prosecutor, Philip established a strong work ethic and quickly earned the respect of judges, supervisors, and colleagues, and the criminal defense bar. Philip's father, Jody, has been a member of the club since 2000, and Philip has been a member since 2011. So please help me thank Philip Ray for his sponsorship. Thanks, Philip. Uh, absolutely, and thank you, Mark. Appreciate you doing that. Next up, we're going to find we're going to learn all kinds of good stuff of what's happening with the Legacy of Leadership class from Holly Hollenbeck. Hey, uh, happy Friday to all my fellow people of action. Um, I am excited to tell you that our Legacy of Leadership group has chosen to help the Bonton Farms, and they have some grant money from uh, Kroger, and we are helping um, Stephanie with putting together uh, menus uh, based on healthy recipes, and then we fill the cart at, uh, on, online with those groceries, and then every Friday, Stephanie picks them up, and uh, volunteers, um, including us Rotarians that are able to go down to Bonton Farms, and we help sort into bags uh, all of the different ingredients that are need to, needed to make up the recipes that we have um, put forth. And then we go and deliver. People come and pick them up. And then some people deliver, uh, have to have them delivered because they're unable to come in and pick them up themselves. So um, these pictures you're seeing now is the sorting and the bagging of the, of the groceries that complete the recipes. And this is a, a picture here of a group that I was down helping with uh, a few weeks ago 
Um, I got the privilege to ride with Stephanie uh, as her driver was gone to uh, go door to door to the 30 some residents that are unable to come in due to mostly health reasons to pick up their bags of groceries themselves. And it was a it was an incredibly rewarding experience. The people were so uh, grateful and so kind and so generous. And many of them wanted us to sit down and chat for a few minutes. And uh, it was a, a fantastic experience. Even if you just go down and help sort the bags and help um, hand them out at the at the restaurant there at Bonton Farms, um, it's a, it's a great experience. And I highly recommend you do that. Um, our Legacy of Leadership group and all us cohorts are going to be doing that as well as you know, the ones that still can't come out yet because of COVID we're doing, are doing the recipes and the cart filling. So it's a great um, project that we can do, you know, split between you know, in-person or not in-person as necessary. So incredibly rewarding opportunity. And uh, we're thrilled as your legacy of leadership graduates to get to uh, do this project for uh, our club. And we welcome you all to join in um, either with uh, uh, donations to Bonton or to come down on a Friday afternoon and help Stephanie with the packing, yeah, sorting, packing and delivering um, of, the, uh, of the food packages for, the, for the, the meals. That's great. Holly, thank you. And, and congratulations to the Legacy of Leadership class. I know that they've worked really hard, not only in the class during the course of the year, listening to the speakers, and, but they've developed out of, out of result of all of this, this great project. Thank you so much. Um, let's talk a little bit about what's coming up in April. As I mentioned earlier, no, no meeting next Friday, but we will be back, um, back to in-person at Magianos. Our speaker that day will be Stephanie Free with the senior housing option, options for today's world. That'll be followed by Paige Fink on the 16th from the Flamley Place and then Carla Nivens uh, which Richard Stanford, I believe, um, was able to line her up. She's with the HPUM United Methodist Church, speaking to us about racial and justice equality. And then save the date, looking ahead to June 25th. That will be the awards banquet and installation at noon at the Park Cities Club. So put that, make sure that Friday's on your calendar. All right, well, with that, we are, I'm going to turn it over to Happy. She is going to um, introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Happy. Lori's, there we go. She's look, um, we're looking for Happy on the, the list of, of names here. Just take a second. Are you there, Happy? Well, you know what? She may have may have dropped a connection. I'm, I'm not seeing her. Um, well, Lori, I don't have your bio in front of me. <laughs> it was in yesterday's hub, though. I'm sure members have read it. But would you mind introducing yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself before you start? Thank you, Barb. I appreciate that. I am Lori Kreider, and I'm a member of the um, Dallas Uptown Club. I'm also in the process of um, helping to charter a new cause-based Rotary Club that will be called the Advocates for Suicide Prevention and Brain Health, and it'll be an e-club. Um, so I also serve as an assistant governor, so I'm serving Duncanville and both Grand Prairie clubs, Grand Prairie Metro and Grand Prairie, so I serve them as an, as an AG. Um, I'm in uh, transportation, uh, specifically semi-trailer leasing, and um, so that, um, I'm also an advocate and really dedicated volunteer for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and that's uh, the program that I will be presenting today. It's called Talk Saves Lives. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen. Okay, just a second, Lori. We're we're trying to. Here we go. Oh, here we, go. we just figured it out. Oh, we had to, we had. I had to become the, the primary here while Lori shared your made you a co-presenter. So you're okay. Go now now you can share your screen. Okay. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Now. Okay. Yeah. Let's get it on to the slide now. Um, these other things want to keep popping up. Let's move that and get it into the presentation mode. Okay, okay, here we go. So again, I'm Lori and um, I'm an uh, advocate and a volunteer for American 
Prevention for um, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And I uh, thank you for the opportunity to present um, their program. Thank you for joining us um, today. So suicide is a complex health issue. Oops. But despite its complexity, suicide can be prevented. So just like there's warning signs and risk factors for other health crises like cardiac arrest, we can learn the warning signs and risk factors that can help us to prevent people from dying by suicide. As with other health issues, prevention can start early, far in advance of the problem, or prevention can occur closer to the time of crisis. Time can be a critical and life-saving measure. Typically, a life can be saved if you allow time for the person's suicide risk to subside or to get through that period of distress and to get mental help. To prevent suicide, we need to identify people who may be suicidal as well as take an active role in connecting them to help before they take action to end their lives. So the purpose of Talk Saves Lives is to provide community members with a general overview about suicide, who it affects, and what can be done to prevent it. This presentation will cover some statistics that'll give you an idea of the scope of the problem of suicide. We're gonna research um, a review, some re key research findings, including the risk and protective factors that relate to suicide. And we'll talk about what works and what we can all do to prevent this leading cause of death. So how we do talk about it does matter. So before we get started, I wanna go over some terminology that is used when we talk about suicide. It's important to model appropriate language so that we do not perpetuate the stigma of mental health conditions. So let's establish a baseline of shared language on the topic. We avoid using the phrase committed suicide as it can have a negative connotation. Instead, we encourage the phrases died by suicide, ended their lives, or killed themselves. When talking about suicide and suicide attempts, we avoid referring to suicide attempts as either failed or successful. Not only is it unnecessary, these words imply judgment. Instead, we encourage the use of phrases such as a suicide attempt, a suicide, or a death by suicide. Educating the public about suicide is critical for encouraging help seeking, raising awareness of risk in vulnerable populations, and advanced, uh, advocating for new interventions and prevention strategies for those at risk. When suicide is talked about safely and accurately, we can help reduce the likelihood of its occurrence. We wanna change how society understands mental health and suicide, because when we open up and connect, talk saves lives. So suicide is a significant issue that affects individuals, families, and communities worldwide. So we'll start with some stats that demonstrate the scope of the problem. So it's a global problem. And according to the World Health Organization, every year over 800,000 people die by suicide worldwide. And while this is the most accurate data available, we estimate the numbers may be higher since suicide is underreported in many countries. So it works out to a suicide every 40 seconds worldwide. So in the US, suicide rates are recorded by the Center for De Disease Control and Prevention. And according to the CDC, 48,344 people died by suicide in 2018. That is the latest official numbers we have. They actually dropped in 2019, but as, as we probably all know, that will not be the case for 2020. But these numbers does make suicide the 10th leading cause of death. It takes more lives in the US annually than homicide, war, and natural disasters combined. It is the second leading cause of death in ages 10 to 44. And then veterans die by suicide at a rate of 22 per day. But again, they think that number is underestimated because they're not really accurately reported. 
So these high numbers are one of many reasons that it's important to talk about suicide like any other cause of death. The more we talk, the less stigmatized the idea that we all face struggles and need support becomes. So for every death by suicide, it is estimated that 25 others attempt. So that's about a million Americans each year who survive a suicide attempt. So when you think about any loss, it impacts many people in the community. Suicide is no different. The loss of, affects family, friends, coworkers, neighbors, schools, faith communities, et cetera. And it is estimated that the majority of Americans will experience a suicide loss over the course of their lifetimes. But in addition to the devastating toll that it has on families and communities, both emotionally and socially, there's a fiscal impact on society as well. So the Center for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that for the year 2016, that uh, suicide, including both attempts and suicide deaths, cost the U.S. 69 billion, um, costs that are primarily due to lost wages and productivity. <coughs> Excuse me. So we'll move on to research. Only in the past several decades have scientists been studying suicide. Research is shedding light on many critical areas, what drives up risk and what that amounts to effective suicide prevention, and we still have more to learn. This section provides an overview of suicide prevention research, key research findings, and future goals in the field. So one of the main questions research explores is, why do people take their own lives? Through research, we have learned that there is no single cause for suicide. It most often occurs when several stressors and health issues converge to create an experience of hopelessness and despair. Research has consistently shown that the large majority of people who die by suicide have a mental health condition at the time of their death. It may or may not have been recognized by the person or their loved ones, and it may or may not have been diagnosed or adequately treated. That said, research has also made it clear that mental health conditions cannot be the whole story. The vast majority of people who have health conditions do not die by suicide. Um, it's surprising to a lot of people that one in four people do experience some sort of mental health um, issue. So it's, it's very common. In addition to mental health conditions, there are many other factors that increase risk as well. We've learned that the brains of people who die by suicide differ from those who die from other causes in terms of structure and function, specifically in the areas related to stress response and impulse control. We've also learned that most people who are suicidal are ambivalent about taking their life. Part of them actually wants to live, but part of them wants to die. So research has informed key strategies in suicide prevention that involve engaging the part of the person that wants to live and helping to create distance from the part of them that wants to die. One way we do that is to help the person connect with reasons for living, while at the same time decreasing the visibility and presence of things around them that facilitate their desire to die. One of the many important things we've learned from research is about the perspective of a suicidal person. A crisis point has been reached. For a suicidal person, the pain seems unbearable, whether it's emotional pain, physical pain, or sometimes it's both. So for a moment, think back to the most painful experience of your life. Maybe it was a kidney stone, a broken arm, childbirth, whatever that was. But at that moment, would you have been able to give someone clear and accurate directions to your house? Probably not. The pain makes ordinary thinking nearly impossible. For a suicidal person, thinking becomes constricted at that moment of crisis, a state of intense tunnel vision where other options seem unavailable. Someone who considers suicide cannot foresee a time when that unbearable pain will end. So understanding the perspective of the suicidal person has also helped us learn that suicidal feelings are often temporary. 
They can come on intensely and can sometimes pass in minutes or hours. So keeping people safe and helping them feel supported can get them through those critical moments. There is evidence that putting time and distance between an individual who is suicidal and the means to take their life can be a life-saving action. This is why it's so important that we take steps when we know someone is struggling to help keep them safe. Research has helped determine the key factors that increase the risk for suicide. Risk factors are defined as characteristics or conditions that increase the chance a person may take their life. Risk factors are important to know to understand the big picture of someone who is considering suicide. Just like someone who is at risk for heart disease because of high blood pressure or a history of heart disease in the family, some people are at higher risk for suicide than others. The main risk factors which are shown here can be grouped into these three categories, health factors, historical factors, and environmental factors. These risk factors can converge at different times in life and increase a person's risk for suicidal behavior at particular points in time. The first type of risk factors include health factors such as biological and psychological medical conditions, the most significant of which are mental health conditions. So as I said before, most people who die by suicide have an active mental health problem at the time of their death. Depression is the most common mental health condition and then the one that is most associated with suicide. Bipolar disorder is also shown to be high risk, but the disorder is less common than depression. Because these conditions put a person at greater risk for suicide, detecting the presence of a mental health condition is critically important. The best way to be sure when you feel concerned or detect a possible change in you or your loved one's mental health is for the person at risk to seek a professional evaluation and effective treatment. Many people may not realize that their distress has actually become a health problem. Providing information about how to access mental health care or a crisis number if their distress is high can be a solid step in helping them to connect to the help they need. We will talk more about this later in the discussion when we directly address that. So mental health conditions are not the only health factors that are associated with suicide risk. Serious or chronic health conditions can increase risk especially when the person has mental health issues. Chronic pain and serious head injuries have also been uh, found to increase suicide risk. The second type of risk factors include historical factors, such as a family history of suicide or um, a family history of mental health conditions or past trauma, such as sexual abuse or combat stress. Research has also found that a history of childhood abuse can contribute to suicide risk. And while most people who attempt suicide do not go on to die by suicide, previous suicide attempts are also considered historical risk factors for suicide and also put a person at increased risk. The third type of the risk factors are environmental factors and um, it, that involve the circumstances of a person's life. Often, there are aspects of a person's environment that can contribute to their overall level of risk. Let's look at a few of the most common. Having access to a way of killing oneself is referred to as access to lethal means. This includes having access to a variety of things such as firearms, drugs, a bridge, a car, etc. Research has shown that contagion, which is the exposure to another person's suicide, or to graphic or sensationalized accounts of suicide, especially among those who with other risk factors can increase a person's risk of suicide. Prolonged stress may include harassment, bullying, relationship problems, legal problems, and unemployment. Stressful life events, which vary across the lifespan, include experiences like divorce, legal problems, or job loss. To better understand suicide risk, here's an example of a set of risk factors that could converge in a person who is suicidal. The example shows what is often the public perception of suicide. When someone dies by suicide, often the story only talks about the environmental factors. 
people see a life event like a breakup or bullying or a job loss, and then they see the person die by suicide. So they might assume the person killed themselves because of that stressful event. But that is never the full story. What others don't know is that the person who died may have had genetic risk factors for suicide. Maybe they were suffering from depression and anxiety disorders, and their work life had become increasingly stressful. The underlying depression and anxiety could have made the situation at work even worse, or the work stress could have made their depression worse. Perhaps they'd also been drinking more than normal. The key is that the combination of risk factors could have contributed to the suicide death. Therefore, while a life event can play a precipitating role for suicidal behavior, without underlying risk factors, life events alone aren't thought to cause suicide. Looking to the future, research will help us find the best ways to fight suicide. Research is looking for biomarkers, for example, something testable in a blood sample that would help us to identify those at risk. A number of clinical treatments, like particular types of therapy, are affected for suicidal people and more need to be developed and studied. The good news is that through research, we are learning more and more about what helps those who are in a suicidal crisis. Research can also help us identify the most effective programs and interventions to reduce suicide rates and to reduce risk in those suffering from mental health conditions. So we'll move on to prevention now. Just like there are risk factors that increase a person's risk for suicide, also there are protective factors that lower a person's risk. If you are proactive about mental health and make an effort to get healthier, you protect yourself. Feeling connected to family and community support can protect against suicide. When someone is struggling with depression, anxiety, psychosis, or substance abuse, these protective factors may, that may normally be strong can erode and temporarily weaken. When that happens, having friends and family to remind us our strengths can be a tremendous protective factor. Problem solving skills help. Life can be really tough, but being able to see a way through problems can be a protective factor. Cultural and religious beliefs that encourage connecting and help seeking discourage suicidal behavior or create a strong sense of purpose can also be a protective factor. So being a part of a great rotary club is very much a protective factor. Because mental health care is so important for preventing suicide, we're going to focus on this topic for a few minutes. Getting effective treatment for mental health conditions like depression or anxiety can prevent suicide. Critical to suicide prevention is getting people connected to mental health treatment. One of the biggest challenges in fighting suicide is getting people to address their mental health in the same way they would for physical health. In fact, of those suffering from a mental health condition, less than half seek treatment. One way to encourage individuals to seek help for their mental health conditions is to treat mental health like any other aspect of our health. Of our health. There are certain times when a person becomes ill or has a chronic health condition to manage and it's critical to seek a trained professional. We need a culture where everyone knows it's smart to take care of our mental health. Taking care of our mental health is just as important as taking care of physical health. Seeing a mental health professional is a sign of strength and many are taking that step. The person seeking help should request a thorough evaluation to figure out if there is a mental health condition affecting their life. There are many types of treatment available like various kinds of psychotherapy and medications. Not everybody needs meds, but some do, and um, it's, a, it's a strength to, to find that. Research has also shown that for many people, the combination of psychotherapy and medications tend to be the most helpful. But the most important thing is to find the treatment that works best for the individual. Good news is that advocacy efforts are improving access to mental health services so that more people can get the treatment they need. The law now requires insurance plans to cover mental health services on par with physical health services. If we need mental health services and one in four of us will at some point, 
we should get treated and get our health back on track faster. Just like people can find strategies that optimize their physical health, people can do the same for their mental health. In addition to professional mental health care, proactive self-care strategies like good sleep habits, exercise, nutrition, stress management, um, even having a pet uh, can also play a critical role in protecting mental health and promoting resilience. Prevention efforts also include support for those touched by suicide. The loss of one person to suicide profoundly impacts many. It's important that survivors have the support they need both to heal and to reduce their suicide risk. Um, and I'll plug in here that um, my church, First Baptist Dallas, is offering um, Christian Survivors of Suicide Law Support Group, which I, along with um, Pam Green, who's the Director of Counseling for First uh, Dallas, um, facilitate this on the second and fourth Wednesdays. Um, but since they're those with lived experiences, those who have attempted suicide or who experience suicidal thinking are at increased risk, we need to make sure they get the support they need too. For people who are at a crisis point, the most important thing you can put between a suicidal person and their way of ending their life is time. Research shows that by temporarily reducing a suicidal person's access to lethal means, we give suicidal individuals time, time for the intense suicidal risk to diminish and time for someone to intervene with mental health support and resources. For the majority of people who experience a suicidal crisis, if they're unable to access their chosen method, even temporarily, they are unlikely to engage in another action to end their life. In most cases, when a suicidal person doesn't have current access to the means that has been on their mind, they don't substitute with another method. Therefore, a clear way to prevent suicide is to limit access to lethal means. During a period of high risk, the safer their environment is, the better chance a suicidal person has of living through that crisis period. Suicide prevention research has looked at a number of ways to create safer environments. Installing an inexpensive carbon monoxide sensor that would automatically shut cars off if mono carbon monoxide levels reach unsafe levels would save lives. We've learned through research that installing barriers on bridges deters suicide, and in many cases, bridge barriers actually lower the suicide rate for the entire region. Restricting access to potentially lethal medications reduces suicide, and it can be as simple as requiring lethal drugs be sold in blister packaging. Firearm safety is critical to reducing suicide rates because in the United States, firearms are used in roughly half of all suicides, making suicide prevention an important part of gun safety education. As noted already, and contrary to what you may think, when access to lethal means are limited, most people who are suicidal do not find other means. Therefore, the suicide death does not occur in that moment, allowing more time for the person in crisis to get connected to help. So now that we've reviewed the key uh, suicide prevention efforts, let's talk about what we can all do to prevent suicide. So it's important to have a caring, supportive some conversation with someone you might be worried about to allow them time to share what they are experiencing. A conversation is a way to show you care and allows you to be able to gain more information about their level of distress. So we'll talk about the warning signs. Watch for the warning signs in yourself and others. While many of the suicide risk factors we discussed endured over a longer period of time, Warning signs are observable signs that signal suicide risk in the near future. It's important to pay attention to both the risk factors discussed earlier and the warning signs we are talking about now. If you see warning signs, reach out to individuals in your life you're concerned about and reach out to others if you are struggling. Seek mental health services if you are depressed or if your anxiety regularly interferes with your daily life and encourage others to do the same. So suicide warning signs are typically displayed in three main ways that we can detect. That is talk, behavior, and mood. 
and we'll discuss each of these in more, more detail. Many people who are suicidal do talk about ending their lives. This may be directly or indirectly. A person might say it outright or they might joke about it, but take it seriously. Some people say they have no reason to live. Others say things that let you know they may feel trapped or they are a burden to others. Or they might talk about feeling overwhelmed or being in unbearable pain. Behaviors that are atypical for an individual should in also encourage you to speak to that person about what you are noticing. People thinking about suicide can display certain behaviors. There may be an increased use of alcohol or drugs. They may have trouble sleeping, either experiencing insomnia or sleeping too much. They may start acting recklessly. They might withdraw from activities, especially ones that they normally enjoy. They might isolate themselves from family and friends. They also might look for a way to kill themselves, such as searching online for methods or shopping for a firearm. They might also give away their possessions or show a related behavior, which is reckless spending. People at risk for suicide can display, often quite subtly, any of the following moods. Depression, apathy, rage, irritability, impulsivity, humiliation, anxiety. Moves one would expect of someone who feels overwhelmed and desperate. We all have ups and downs in our mood, but when you notice a change that seems uncharacteristic or concerning, it's important to speak to that person about what you're noticing. For example, sudden unexplained happiness can indicate that the individual has decided on a plan and is relieved that they will no longer be in pain. So that's a lot of things to look for. So we'll sum it up with we'll look for changes in behavior and trust your instincts. Assume that you're the only one who's gonna reach out because in too many instances, people talked about their concern for someone amongst themselves, but hesitate to reach out to the person directly. So here's a rule of thumb. If you're wondering if someone is depressed or overly anxious, that's a sure sign you should reach out. And the same goes for you. If you are having suicidal thoughts, that's a sure sign you need to seek help. If you have reached out before, then reach out again. The first time the person may not be receptive, but keep trying. Try talking to someone else or with a professional. And even if suicide turns out not to be a concern, they still may be in distress and they may feel comforted and supported just by knowing that you care and are taking the time to listen. So how do you reach out to someone? Well, you talk to them in private, you listen to their story, you express concern and caring, and you ask directly about suicidal thoughts. Don't be afraid to ask the question, are you thinking of ending your life or are you thinking of hurting yourself? Encouraging them to seek mental health services. If they're in a crisis, then take them to help. There are some things we should um, avoid when talking with someone who may be suffering from depression or anxiety. Uh, first of all, avoid minimizing their feelings. Those of us who have never experienced major depression literally cannot imagine what it feels like. Avoid trying to convince them life is worth living. If a person is nearing a crisis point, they are not thinking clearly. Philosophical debates about life being worth li living tend not to be helpful. Avoid trying to fix it or advice to fix it. If the person is having a heart attack, you wouldn't tell them to start exercising or to eat a healthier diet. If they are in crisis, what they need is to be heard and then led to help. Listen to their story and offer to help them find a health professional. Help them take active steps toward keeping their environment safe. If you think they might make an attempt on their life soon, then stay with them. Do not leave them alone. However, if the situation puts your own safety at risk, leave the area immediately and call 911. Help them remove lethal means or remove themselves from the potentially dangerous area. Escort them to mental health services or an emergency room. Help them call the lifeline or call the lifeline yourself um, and a trained uh, counselor will tell you what you should do to help the person in distress. If they don't feel comfortable speaking to a counselor on the phone, they can also text TALK 
to 741-741, which is crisis text line. So this is a great time to take out your phone and enter both of these numbers into your phone, because even if you never need them for yourself, you may need them for somebody else. So um, I highly encourage just take a minute to, um, uh, to enter those uh, in your phone. But if it's an emergency, such as a suicide in, uh, attempt in progress, then obviously call 911. So together we can create a culture that's smart about mental health. We will save lives and vastly improve the lives of many more. It's a simple yet powerful idea, talk saves lives. By caring and reaching out, we can all play a part in suicide prevention. So again, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to present this presentation to you. And the reason that I do this um, is because I mentioned earlier that I'm an advocate and volunteer for the AFSP. And that is because back in 2015, April 8th of 2015, um, my 20-year-old nephew ended his life and it was a complete and total shock. He was actually involved at his church the day that he took his life. Um, total, total shock, the church, our whole family, everybody um, just in shock. So I wanna do anything that I possibly can um, to hopefully prevent anybody else from from losing their Jesse. And unfortunately, I had another loss a couple of weeks ago back um, from my, where I grew up in, um, in Alabama. Um, I grew up with that family and, um, and this guy ended up moving off to, to Auburn, Alabama to become a veterinarian. And um, he was 41, had a couple of young kids, wife, um, great family. He took his life. And what I learned after this process is that the occupation of veterinarian is three and a half times more likely to uh, die by suicide than other professions. And that was a shock to me. I had no idea that so many veterinarians take their lives. I've learned also about an organization called uh, Not One More Vet, and it's not veterans, it's veterinarians. And it is to support um, veterinarians and to try to reduce that suicide number in those populations. So I thought, well, why is that that this happens? Um, they unfortunately get bullied a lot online. Um, they, they get cyber bullied. Um, they could be physically attacked over something like a gerbil. Um, they also are, and I've heard this, especially during the pandemic, you know, they may be putting five or more pets down per day. Um, and that would, I imagine, be very depressing. Veterinarians generally love animals, and you know, many of them have cared for those animals their their entire pet life. So um, that is that is why I do this: is to just um, get the word out that there there is hope, and that it's a strength to talk about it. I'm happy that people like Dak Prescott have spoken out. Dak's brother, who was 31, died last April by suicide. He was a primary caregiver for their mother. So later in the summer, Dak came out and said it was suicide and that he himself struggled with anxiety and depression in the pandemic. And then uh, Kate Middleton, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, came out and spoke about being suicidal herself. So it, it's very good that we get this out in the open, talk about it where people will be comfortable getting help. So again, thank you again for your time. Lori, thank you. That was just wonderful, wonderful information. Um, we do have one question from a member is asking, is there a condition that can be described as chronic depression? And if so, how is that dealt with? Yes, uh, chronic depression is, and there's also clinical depression, which my grandmother had. So that's one, that's one of the genetic things. Clinical depression runs in my family. My grandmother had to be on meds until she died in her late eighties, a few years ago. She would start feeling better and she would go off of the meds and then she would start to become excessively depressed again. So there is clinical depression and there's chronic and um, talking with a professional about that would be best because there's different treatments for, for different people, but, but certainly it is. Gotcha, well, thank you. 
Well, um, we're going to do things a little, little reverse today. Happy is back on the line, and she just had a little bit of technical difficulty because she's traveling. But we're going to do your introduction now at the end. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Happy. Hi there. Can y'all hear me this time? Yes. Okay, good. I apologize. I was there. I was like, why can't y'all hear me? And uh, anyway, so happy, happy Friday. Aloha from uh, Hawaii. I, uh, so Lori and I've been friends uh, pretty much since she moved to, uh, to Dallas. And so she's one of my uh, closest friends in Dallas. I appreciate her talking to us today. You know, most of us have been uh, impacted uh, by suicide, either from a family member or a friend. Um, and just this week, the, the CEO of uh, Texas Roadhouse committed suicide. He had uh, COVID and it was having uh, tinnitus in his ear. And um, uh, so it, it, it's definitely something that we should talk about and, uh, and be prepared uh, to help our loved ones um, better with. You, uh, at any time that, uh, you know, after this, you, you think, oh, I, I really wish I had still had Lori's contact info. You can always reach out to me and I can get you Lori's contact info. Oh, and uh, she's a, yeah, she's a great resource. And uh, uh, Zach, I did want to uh, tell you you're exactly right. I had to think about where that picture was. It, uh, it was at the Oasis restaurant in uh, Lake Travis. You're exactly right. And uh, Holly, great work on the, uh, and to all of y'all with the Legacy of Leadership. That's just an incredible project uh, uh, that y'all are doing. Um, so wrapping up, Lori is an Alabama native with a Bachelor of Arts degree from Birmingham Southern College. She joined the Rotary Club of Dallas Uptown in 2010 after relocating to Irving from Columbia, South Carolina. She served as the club president of the Rotary Club of Dallas Uptown in 2014, 2015. She has served as club treasurer, foundation chair, as well as social media chair. She's currently involved in chartering the Rotary Club of Advocates for Suicide Prevention and the Brain Health E-Club. She's also involved in Rotary at the district level. She's the AG for uh, the Duncanville, Grand Prairie, and Grand Prairie Metro Rotary Clubs. She's also served the clubs of Irving Las Colinas, Carrollton Farmers Branch, and Capel. She serves the community as a dedicated advocate and volunteer for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, the Junior League of Dallas, and as a member of the First Baptist Church of Dallas, where she's a facilitator for Christian Survivors of Suicide Loss Support Group. Uh, yeah, so let her know if uh, you or one of your loved ones is interested in getting more information on that group as well. Lori is the account manager for Duval Semi Trailers and is a past president of the Transportation Club of Dallas Fort Worth, where she currently serves as treasurer. In her free time, Lori spends a lot of time outdoors hiking and playing golf. If you, uh, and a final side note, if you want to know about some of the best uh, hiking trails in Dallas, uh, contact Lori. She is, has, has found all the routes. She's a lover of music and plays the French horn. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Happy. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, that was great. Happy, thank you so much. Um, Lori, like I said, we really learned a lot and we appreciate your dedication to this cause, which is, is definitely, definitely worthy. Uh, we are going to place a book in the Preston Hollow Elementary School in your honor for taking the time to speak to us today. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. You are very welcome. Um, just a reminder, folks, no meeting next Friday. Enjoy your holiday weekend. Um, I, before we go to the four-way test, I am going to ask, um, take this opportunity to thank the producer and the director and Lori, who is sitting next to me here. Um, she's done an amazing job uh, with this learning how to use Zoom, learning how to, to create PowerPoint slides. Um, and I've, this has gone really well the last few months. And a special thank you, Lori, to, to you from all of us. So we are scrolling our way through here and we're gonna to get to the four-way test. So if everyone, please unmute yourself and join me in reciting the four-way test. The four-way test of the things we think. Things we think, say, do. First. 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 Well, with that, I have rung the bell and we will be, I uh, hope everyone enjoys your weekend and I really look forward to seeing everyone. Remember to register online first so that you can attend our in-person meeting on April 9th. All right. Well, have a great weekend all.
Be safe. Yeah. Yeah. Good to see Bye. everybody. Good to see, good to see you. Good to see everybody. That was great. Thank you so much, Lori. It's awesome. Happy Easter, everyone. Happy Easter. Again.